Good morning. I'm Jim Roberts, and on behalf of the Heritage Foundation, I'd like to welcome you to this Heritage Foundation webinar on freedom or equality. And we're delighted that you tuned in this morning. We're going to, I hope, have a very rich discussion about these important issues. Uh, first of all, I'd like to invite my, my colleagues, my co-participants, to join us online. Uh, just a reminder that this session is being recorded and will be emailed to you and posted on heritage.org events within 48 hours. And later we'll talk about questions that you can submit. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, first off, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Daniel Lacaye, joining us from Madrid, Spain this morning. Uh, Daniel Lacaye is an economist and fund manager. He is the author of numerous books, including the, the one we're discussing this morning, which I hope will be a bestseller, as his others have been, Life in the Financial Markets, The Energy World is Flat, Escape from the Central Bank Trap. Uh, Danielle is a professor of global economy at the IE Business School in Madrid and has been ranked as one of the 20 top most influential economists in the world. He holds the CIIA Financial Analyst title, has a postgraduate degree in, in IS, IESE and a master's degree in economic investigation. As a member of the advisory board of the Rafael Del Pino Foundation in Madrid and a commissioner of the community of Madrid in London, has been seen regularly on CNBC, Bloomberg TV, BBC, Hedge Eye, Seeking Alpha, Business Leader, and numerous other uh, outlets, and occasionally in the, Wo the World Economic Forum, Focus Economics, The Financial Times, and The Wall Street Journal. So welcome, Danielle. So glad you could join us. Our second guest is, is my esteemed colleague from the Heritage Foundation, Dr. Uh, Robert Bob Moffat, who is a senior fellow in domestic policy studies at Heritage. Bob has long specialized in healthcare and entitlement programs, especially Medicare, and has achieved national and international prominence for his expertise. He brings to the reform effort his government expertise as a former senior US government official at the Department of Health and Human Services and in the Office of Personnel Management during the Reagan administration. Bob is the co-author of Why Obamacare is Wrong for America, in which hit number four on the Washington Post bestseller list. He's a contributor to A Time for Governing Policy Solutions from the Pages of National Affairs, has contributed to controversial issues in social policy, a university textbook on public policy, and has published numerous professionals, numerous professional and specialty journals, in addition to countless numbers of publications published by the Heritage Foundation. So, Bob, uh, it, uh, it's really an honor to have you here also, with a master's degree and a doctorate from the University of Arizona. And I look forward to having a discussion with both of you. I will just start out now with a brief uh, introduction highlighting our annual index of economic freedom that the heritage foundation has done since 1995 this is our 26th year the index of 2020 i should say up front that the 2020 index was done prior to covid the data year for us runs from it would have been uh july 1st 2018 to june 30 2019 and so obviously uh we have many challenges now around the world to economic freedom, but um, we will, and, and even the 2021 edition will not fully capture the impact, but nevertheless, uh, the important principles remain unchanged and in fact, are going to be very important for the world as it recovers from uh, this uh, terrible pandemic that we're all enduring right now. As you can see the world, since we started the index in the years just after the Cold War ended, world economic freedom has, has gone up significantly as the world was freed from communism and began uh, global trading, raise, uh, rise, raising the, the uh, boats, as you might say, uh, incomes and standard of living for hundreds of millions of people all around the world. And that has been what we have tracked. We measure 180 countries every year and we rank them uh, in categories, as you can see on the next slide, um, from free, mostly free, moderately free, mostly unfree, and, and repressed. And it's obvious that 
with more economic freedom, you have a better average GDP per capita, and um, you have just a greater economic freedom and, and that. The next slide shows, uh, again, even within regions, and we have five regions we cover in the world, but within those regions, it's very important that countries have economic freedom. If they don't, they have much less, um, much, much less income and lower standards of living. The next slide is just another reminder that this, these figures are important, not just on a year by year basis, but over five, 15, 25 years, countries that have more economic freedom have more growth. And that, uh, that is something that countries without it permanently lose that opportunity to grow because they're trapped uh, in you know, backward or un unproductive uh, economic policies. The next slide, another indicator that economic freedom, the, uh, the uh, market democracy led, private sector led um, economies uh, lift more people out of poverty and also, and also uh, lift people out of extreme po poverty is the, the next slide indicates much in the world of international development much has been concentrated much of the focus is on relieving the extreme poverty and here again you see that economically freer countries have less extreme policy poverty the next slide is an important one and something that touches very much on what we're going to be discussing today and that is the level of social goods and the quality and, and availability of the social goods healthcare. Uh, better environment, better cleaner water, air, uh, not trash in the streets, and, and better education opportunities. And countries with more resources that have had greater economic freedom are able to provide these very valuable and important social goods to their citizens. And in fact, of course, today we'll be focusing with Dr. Moffitt on the healthcare aspect of that slide. Another just way of putting that on the next slide is the uh, human development and social progress, which is, is highly correlated to uh, democracy stability of democracy and economic freedom are highly correlated. And we'd invite you uh, to look at our website heritage.org slash index for more information about our annual index of economic freedom. And with that, I am going to ask uh, Dr. Lakaye to come on now and to talk about his book that we're going to be discussing today, Freedom or Equality. Welcome, uh, Danielle, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you, uh, Heritage Foundation, for this uh, great event. Thank you, Bob, as well, for joining. Uh, I think uh, I could not be joined by more important people to discuss the importance of what uh, is going on right now globally. Um, this book, Freedom or Equality, was not written uh, considering, obviously, the risk of a pandemic or the understanding what was going to happen with COVID-19. However, it is uh, interesting to see that the majority of the myths that uh, I tried to debunk uh, in the book, the idea that more government is going to solve all the problems, the idea that what we need is a universal healthcare system with uh, one single payer, and the idea that money printing is going to solve all the problems of humanity uh, are subjects that are, are currently very hot in the discussion globally about how to solve the challenges that the COVID-19 uh, crisis brings. And uh, the idea of behind the book is to provide arguments to the reader uh, so that we can uh, not just counterattack those siren calls that tell us that it's important to give up more freedom in order to get a certain level of security that governments cannot give and that certainly have been unable to give during this crisis. Uh, but it's also a book about solution. It's a book that uh, tries to give ideas on how to develop capitalism to uh, address the rising challenges of the global economy, be it healthcare itself, be it uh, education, uh, environment, etc. It is very important to understand uh, the lessons learned at least the ones that we should learn from this crisis. The first one is that 
uh, we should not give more power to governments that have been completely unable to not just analyze and adequately uh, prevent the healthcare crisis, but to understand that if we implemented the measures and the policies that uh, the most radical part of the Democratic Party or so many of the left-wing parties in the European Union and the rest of the world are trying to uh, tell us to implement, which are massive government intervention, what we would have in this crisis would not be just a healthcare crisis. We would have shortages of supplies, we would have problems of achieving and getting the goods and services that we have been able to get thanks to what? Thanks to competition, thanks to the uh, admirable level of adaptation that companies have achieved in a, such a drastic and uh, challenging environment, and also due to the free market environment. I think that this crisis shows that more government is not the solution, but this crisis also shows that the way in which governments have addressed the crisis is also very, very important to understand how economies will get out of the crisis. We're talking about recovery right now. We're talking about uh, an improvement in durable goods orders, an improvement in continuing uh, jobless claims in the United States that have surprised everybody in the market. And many people look at the overall macro data and say, well, mm, the United States has implemented similar monetary and fiscal policies to those of the Eurozone. However, the International Monetary Fund or the OECD have massively downgraded the growth estimates for 2020 for the Eurozone and also for 2021, but not for the United States. What is the difference? The difference is supply side measures. What this crisis shows us is that the economy is much more important than what many governments expected. The idea that shutting down the economy was going to be insignificant and generate no harm could only be something created by a bureaucrat. And the idea that the recovery is going to be exactly the same, applying the policies that have been wrongly applied in the previous crisis was also something that only a bureaucrat could think. If there's anything that, is, that has been proven, and I'm sure that uh, Dr. Moffat will talk about it in a, in a, in a couple of uh, minutes, is that it's very interesting to see how the healthcare crisis has been better addressed by those countries that have better levels of economic freedom, as shown by the Economic Freedom Index, and countries that actually spend less relative to GDP on public healthcare. We look at South Korea, we look at Singapore, we look at so many countries that are not just at the top of the table that the index of economic freedom shows, but also at the bottom of the table in terms of massive spending and huge government intervention in areas as key as healthcare. This is an important lesson from this crisis. An important lesson from this crisis as well is to understand that it is impossible to believe that if we have had a challenge to address a pandemic, in 2020 that the solution is simply to spend more and more consistently. The monetary policy that governments are following and that central banks are following is already hugely expansionary. There has never been a larger balance sheet in, of, in the major uh, central banks all over the world. Secondly, we have never seen a, a level of government stimuli as the one that we're seeing right now. And the reality is that GDP growth estimates are coming down. So we need to think of supply side measures. And we need to think of supply side measures because this crisis is a crisis that was created precisely by the decision from governments to shut down the economy uh, by law. Um, I think that it's important to address the, the economic situation with supply side measures because the challenges that we're facing in terms of technology in terms of uh, job creation, in terms of healthcare, in terms of education, and in terms of the environment can only be addressed thanks to the wonderful combination of competition, 
free market and fair trade. It is it has been a big mistake in the past years to believe that governments would do all of these and not only at the same time, but more importantly, with the idea that they would do it with for the benefit of everybody. It is completely untrue. Why does the book differentiate freedom and equality? Because equality is a consequence of growth, job creation, and prosperity. We cannot put equality as an objective. We cannot put equality as the principle that rules government policy. And we definitely cannot put equality as the only thing that by which societies judge themselves. There is unquestionably a positive in mimic inequality. People get do better, and because we see peers of ours doing better, that allows us and that are actually incentivizes to do better ourselves. Inequality in itself is not bad. The worst inequality that exists is the inequality between government and taxpayers. And that is the one that is going to increase more drastically in the next few years. That is why it is so important that we implement uh, important supply side measures tax reductions to allow the companies that have been suffering in this crisis to uh, return to growth, to recover the investment and to recover the jobs that they have lost in this period. Tax improvements as well in order to allow new companies to come to the market. It's very important to understand that the highest job creators are not just small companies, but the new companies. So we need to incentivize new company generation supply side measures as well to allow citizens to have more disposable income. We know that uh, transfers and subsidies don't improve the situation of the middle class and the most disfavored. So what we need to do is to apply those lessons learned, not just from this crisis, but from the mistakes of the past 10 years in which the level of government intervention globally has risen, in which the tax wedge has completely uh, reduced the growth of investment in many economies, to understand that those uh, policies, supply side policies, are the ones that have made the United States a success in recovering capital expenditure growth, in recovering job creation, in recovering wage growth, and actually, funnily enough, in improving equality. So, uh, just to summarize, what this book tries to give is uh, ideas so that all of us can discuss the things that are sold to us as magic solutions, debunk them, but also it provides solutions, realistic solutions that can be applied today in order to improve the welfare for all without mm, equalizing down, which is the only thing that governments can do through massive intervention. Thank you very much. And I hand out uh, the floor to uh, Bob Mock, who is going to certainly talk a lot and very well about the challenges of healthcare. Yes, thank you, uh, Bob. You're, you're on now, and especially since we're in a healthcare crisis and the temptation is to nationalize healthcare systems, and I know you have a lot to say about that. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yes. Yeah, we can hear you now, Bob. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, well, right now, uh, ground zero in the domestic policy debate in the United States is the future of healthcare. Healthcare makes up almost 20% of the American economy. The government controls basically almost half of the healthcare uh, economy in the United States. But we are actually in the, in the midst of debating something that uh, we've never taken seriously before. It was always a fringe uh, position. But rather, it is the concept of a single payer healthcare system where the federal government would simply take over the entire healthcare system of the United States. And you've got to hand it to Senator Bernie Sanders, uh, who's the independent socialist of Vermont and uh, half of the Democratic membership of the House of Representatives who are making it very clear, crystal clear and black and white legislation, exactly what they want to do. They want to create a national health 
health insurance program, a government health insurance program, abolish all uh, private uh, and employment-based health insurance, eliminate traditional Medicare, eliminate the federal employee health benefits program and other government programs, and restrict, actually, in black and white, restrict the ability of patients to go outside uh, of the government program to pick and choose the kind of health care they want uh, to get the health care they want outside of the government system. Now, I'm going to say up front, uh, there's a lot wrong with our health care system. Costs are too high. It's too bureaucratic. You cannot, un you cannot see, uh, in many cases, you don't know the price of medical services. And there are all kinds of bureaucratic impediments that you find both in the public and the private health insurance markets. There's a lot to fix. But at the same time, instead of fixing what, uh, what, what is clearly wrong uh, with American health care, uh, a very, very significant, as I said, a very significant uh, portion of, the, uh, of, of our political leadership in this country, half of the Democrats in the House of Representatives, are on record in favor of abolishing it all in favor of a government takeover. I understand the emotional appeal of what they're trying to say. They propose free care for all, universal coverage. We're going to do away with uh, premiums, deductibles, unforeseen medical costs. We're going to do away with managed care networks. And we're going to have serious uh, government-enforced uh, cost control. The question I think Americans have to ask themselves is this. How would such a program actually work in practice? Where do people go if they do not or they cannot uh, get health care that they want or need uh, from the government program? Uh, how will this system actually work out in practice? Well, we, we hear a lot of promises from Senator Sanders, from the House Democrats, from um, AOC, right? We hear a lot of promises about how the system will work. They promise, for example, a universal right to health care, free care at the point of service. The reality is that uh, you will not get a universal access to health care. The, the internal logic actually contradicts it. Let me explain. If health care is a, a right, a, a legal right, free at the point of service, now 331 million Americans, that is for all practical purposes, have what, what the economists would call a free good. Well, consumers of a free good behave as if the good is free, even if it's not. So if health care is indeed a free good, then you're going to have an, an, an economic demand for that free good that is unlimited. But with unlimited demand at any given point in time, you collide with limited supply. And that means government officials, not doctors, not patients, are going to have to make the, P, the big decisions about who gets care, when they get care, under what circumstances they get care. And those decisions are going to be political decisions or bureaucratic decisions. They're not even, they're not going to be medical decisions. And that is, in fact, the result. What happens in effect is people are forced into waiting. In Canada, right now, which Canada has a single payer universal government program, Canada, according to the Commonwealth Fund, a liberal think tank, has the longest waiting time of any of patients uh, out of almost all Western industrial countries. To their credit, the British media are very, very open about the uh, problems that plague the, the British National Health Care uh, Service. Over 4 million British patients right now are waiting uh, on lists for surgery. Uh, more than one in five British cancer patients have been waiting longer than two months to begin treatment after receiving a referral uh, from the general practitioner. Now, that's not to say we don't have our problem. In the United States, however, only 6% of patients had to wait more than two months to see a medical specialist, compared to 39% of patients in Canada and 19% of patients in Great Britain. Uh, single payer folks say that, well, basically, you're going to pay, uh, Americans are going to actually spend less, and they're going to have less uh, in healthcare spending, and we're going to have greater, uh, uh, greater opportunity to spend money on other things. Well, really, the fact is, is that all independent econometric analyses of these, all, almost all the serious ones, the Urban Institute, which is a liberal think tank, and the Mercatus Center, which is a conservative think tank, and the Rand Corporation, which is not partisan at all, all of them say, in effect, that Americans are actually going to be spending more under a, a single-payer system, not less. And as, as far as direct pocketbook, huh, Americans are actually going to be spending more in terms of higher taxes under this kind of a system uh, than they are today, in fact. You're going to see a doubling of federal taxes, according to the Mercatus Institute and the Urban Institute. 
No question about it. In fact, a, a, a former advisor of President Clinton said that 71% of American households are going to be spending more on health care under a single payer system, a government run system, uh, than in fact uh, they're paying today. So it's not, there's, no, uh, there's no easy way out of this. Forget the promises. Progressive politicians promise a, a lot more than they can deliver. Let's be honest. We've got a lot of problems in our health care. It's too bureaucratic. Prices are often unknown. There are too many people who have no idea what the health care services, goods and services cost. And there are too many restrictions on the ability of individuals to get the kind of care they want, the kind of health and coverage that they want. We've got to fix this. There's no question about that. But it's not going to be done in one single big bill. We tried that with Obamacare, and believe me, we had a lot of kickback on that. A lot of things that politicians promised, they could not deliver, including the president, President Obama himself. You remember the promises. If you like your plan, you can keep it. If you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. You're going to see a $2,500 reduction in your health care uh, insurance costs, right? None of that happened. We have got to take steps to do a number of different things. We've got to reduce stupid, counterproductive, and costly regulation in the insurance markets that are driving health insurance costs up. The second thing we have to do is we have to take steps to allow people to pick and choose the kind of coverage they want and the kind of care they want without a tax or regulatory penalty. In the long run, that means not only reducing the regulatory system, but getting a fairer tax treatment of health insurance so that if some American goes out and wants to buy health insurance on their own, they'll be able to do it without a tax penalty that makes it impossible for them to cost to, to afford their health care. And one more thing, ultimately, the end at the end of the day, health care is between a doctor and a patient. It is the doctor who is going to treat the patient. The doctor should be in charge of the delivery of care the patient should be in charge of the financing of care. If we get that division right, if we get that division of labor right, we will see a restoration of the traditional doctor-patient relationship, and we will see an increase in the quality of American health care across the board. We have a lot of work to do. Um, and frankly, uh, I'm very happy we're having this discussion with Danielle because you don't want to have a system where, in fact, there are no options. And let me tell you what the what the progressives in Congress are proposing is a system where there is no way out, no exit. Americans want their freedom. They want alternatives. They want choice. And health insurance companies should be forced by changes in law to compete directly for a patient's dollars. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Bob. That was excellent and enlightening. Uh, it sounds to me as if uh, the only equality under Medicare for all would be that everyone would have to wait for health care and it might well be uh, of inferior quality than what certainly Americans are used to. So now I'd like to move to the uh, question and answer segment of this presentation. And uh, both of my colleagues are, are with me online. Um, I am going to just uh, remember that you can submit questions in the questions box. Please identify yourself by name and organization. Um, so uh, here's a question from our uh, uh, um, very good friend and colleague, Alejandro Chafuan of uh, uh, Acton Institute. And he asks, which countries will recover faster? Analysts say China, do you trust China's macroeconomic data? I guess this goes really to Daniel. Thank you very much. Um, I, well, we cannot believe, for example, that uh, China's uh, figures are showing now a complete discrepancy uh, between GDP and electricity consumption, uh, retail consumption, et cetera. There's been a disconnect between the, the, let's say, aggregated macro data and the more refined data. If you look at corporate profits, et cetera, they don't show the level of recovery that some are uh, implying. No? What I believe is that the countries that will recover faster are the ones that implement the earliest those measures that I mentioned before. 
I think that uh, if you look, for example, at the estimates of the IMF and the OECD, they're very diplomatic. They show that the Eurozone and the United States will recover more or less at the same pace. That is not the estimates that we have. We have that the United States will recover about three quarters earlier than the Eurozone and twice as fast. We uh, also uh, believe that it will be uh, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, the countries that also will recover, will lose less GDP and recover faster. And within, the, within Europe, interestingly, and coming back to the Index of Economic Freedom, uh, you're going to see that it's actually countries like Switzerland, like Austria, uh, that will recover uh, much quicker than the large economies, Germany, France, or the Southern European economies. Latin America find also a double, completely different uh, type of, of recovery. We believe that Chile, for example, Colombia are going to recover much faster than Mexico, Brazil, or Argentina. So I think that uh, what, what, what this crisis in the recovery phase is going to show is that the countries that are closest uh, to high levels of economic freedom are the ones that are going to recover, not just faster, but stronger, because recovering is relatively easy by inflating GDP with debt. Great. Thank you, Daniel. The next question is uh, related to uh, what Daniel was talking about uh, from Christian Milford, who wants to know why it seems that the leftist protesters we're seeing on the streets of Europe and the United States right now. Um, I assume they would be happy to admit that they enjoy living in a country that benefits as the fruits of a free market. And the question is, but they're railing against capitalism writ large and against the rule of law by, by making Ill Ill illegal sort of mob and insurgent um, actions that we're seeing today, which are very disturbing. And why, why don't they uh, leave the United States or leave Western Europe and go to countries that have autocratic regimes that they, they pretend to uh, admire? Danielle, maybe you take that one also. I think, I think it's a great question. And it comes back to, the, to something that I, that I talk about in the book, is that totalitarians and the extreme left, uh, they are not looking for prosperity. They're looking for control. They're not interested in improving the economy or getting the most disadvantages back to work. They're interested in increasing control. And this is an important factor when we discuss with those people. I think that um, uh, they all understand that the socialist model is completely unsellable. That's why they had to use the subterfuge of the Nordic countries as something to sell to voters when as you see in the in the index of economic freedom and in my book the nordic countries are actually some of the uh, highest in terms of uh, economic freedom respect for private property respect for individual liberty and respect for uh, the right to uh, you know uh, be that's why they have one of the highest levels of wealth inequality um, not uh, not just uh, 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 income inequality, but in, I think it is very important to understand the the very big risk that Bob was also mentioning is that what what is being sold is an idea a utopian a utopian idea of socialism that doesn't exist. But once they achieve control. What we are seeing in many countries, for example, in Europe right now, is that once they achieve the maximum level of control and citizens get angry because obviously the government, the politicians don't deliver the, the, the promise that they had made, they always resort to two things. The first one is manipulation of data. And the second one is uh, repression of citizens. So we have to be very, 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 uh, a, aggressively discussing and combating these ideas because their objective is not to get uh, to make things better for the most disadvantaged their objective is only to gain control and then implement uh, uh totalitarianism 
Thank you, Danielle. That's an important call. Here's a question for Dr. Moffat, uh, a viewer of this webinar in Maryland. <clears throat> person in their 30s says they're paying $460 a month or $5,500 a year for their medical care, for which they're getting four or five doctor visits at the most. Dr. Moffat, are there models with projected dollar amounts for various one-payer plans? It's hard to envision how this person could be spending more than they are. Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, every uh, uh, Maryland is something I know a lot about. I used to be chairman of the Maryland Healthcare Commission. And uh, I think the uh, health care costs in Maryland are ex extraordinarily high. They have been historically high. Maryland is much like Massachusetts or Connecticut. And uh, historically, a lot of different things go into the premium cost that people pay and their out-of-pocket costs. It is a fact that uh, in Maryland and many other states of the union, uh, with the enactment of Obamacare, uh, we basically saw a dramatic increase in premiums, actually 125% increase in premiums over a period of five years um, in the individual and the small group markets. Um, it's been a disaster. Uh, the idea is, is that we will pay less uh, with uh, a single payer system on an individual basis. But uh, I mentioned uh, uh, Professor Kenneth Thorpe, uh, who is, was an advisor to um, uh, uh, President Clinton, actually. He's not a conservative by any stretch of the imagination. He did an analysis of the, uh, of the, um, uh, of the Sanders plan. Uh, and his conclusion was is that uh, overwhelmingly, most Americans, ordinary Americans, would actually be paying more because of the higher taxes required uh, to fund the program. And his point was is that 71% of all uh, households would actually be paying more. Now, you can contest that, uh, but uh, you know my colleagues at the Heritage Foundation have done, and I recommend it to anybody, a major study by Ed Heiselmeyer and Jamie uh, Hall on the tax impact of Medicare for All. Uh, they basically match, I confirm, basically what Professor Thorpe has said. Uh, the same thing is true with the RAND Corporation. The Rand Corporation is nonpartisan, but they've indicated that Americans are actually going to be paying more. And there's a reason for that. As I kind of indicated, if you take the position that we're going to have free care for all, there's an unlimited demand for the free care. So what you're going to do is you're going to have a tremendous spike in the demand for medical services. They're going to try to, and I'm not saying they're not going to try to meet it. They're going to try to meet it, but of course they can't. So what they'll do is they'll resort to some kind of a rationing scheme usually some kind of a waiting list system like they do in Britain or Canada uh, to control the cost. Now, look, we got, it, it, look, and I spent in Maryland, I'm particularly uh, sensitive to that because I have relatives who have actually paid $1,600 a month, a young family of four uh, paying $1,600 a month for health insurance. They're paying the equivalent of uh, a second mortgage. This is absurd. There's no reason to do that, especially if you have younger, healthier people. Um, so we have a lot of work to do here, but uh, again, the idea is to give people the opportunity to pick and choose a plan that is best for them, not what some government officials say that they must have. And in the case of Obamacare, whether you like it or not, you have a comprehensive Cadillac coverage, soup to nuts, of whether in fact you need all of those services or, or benefits or not, but you're forced to pay for them. And so therefore you have an inflated uh, premium cost. Hmm. Thanks, Bob, for that. <clears throat> now, here's a question for me. How do you respond to the charge that the correlation between economic freedom in the Heritage Index and the GDP per capita or other measures are a case of reverse causality? What time series data do we have that shows specifically that it is the increase in freedom that is the causal factor in growth? And it's submitted by Jacob uh, Buescher. Um, thank you for that question, Jacob. I think. Of course, we never say in that uh, that uh, freedom, economic freedom, is it is ca uh, it has causation with prosperity. There are many other aspects, and there are some problems with feedback loops. Uh, all of our data for the 26 years we've done the index is available on our website at heritage.org/index. Uh, maybe I'll ask uh, Dr. Lakai, if he could also weigh in on this question, because it's one that's asked about many of the in indices around the world. 
There is absolutely, you can certainly attach uh, the level of causality with the incremental proportions of uh, the benefits. No, I think that when you see, for example, that countries that have consistently been at the in the in the places of free or more free, relatively free or very free, you see that, for example the increments in access to healthcare, the incre increments in access to uh, mm, the education, etc., and the GDP per capita are actually much better than those that in the same time frame show uh, that they were either worsening in the index or remaining at the lower level of uh, freedom and I think that it's it's very interesting because if you look at the different segments of what comprises the position of a country in economic freedom, you can understand perfectly why uh, an improvement in two or three of those uh, elements are going to generate a multiplier effect. I would start from the example, independence, independence of institutions, taxation, government levels of intervention. And I think that, um, uh, it, that that's how you see the progress. If you look at, for example, the one of the charts that you were showing at the beginning, Jim, um, is that you can see that the, is the exponential improvement as those countries stay within the uh, range of between very free to relatively to relatively free in the in the top twenty to top thirty. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Here's a follow-up for you, Danielle, from Michael Secreto. Why doesn't the Nordic social safety net result in folks working less hard and with reduced benefit quality and shortages? Maybe uh, Bob could also weigh in. Yeah, the, 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 the fallacy of the Nordic system uh, starts from the fact that there are very small countries, no? and the vast majority of them you cannot even start to make when when I hear Ocasio Cortez, when I hear Bernie Sanders talk about the Nordic model of countries that are smaller than a borough in New York, makes absolutely no sense. But the I think that uh, uh, if there is anything that we learn from the Nordic system is that it, those are systems based on penalty generated from the civil society to those that uh, abuse the system. It's a very bottom up approach, not a top down approach. And, uh, and what it shows as well is that the wealth inequality, that the level of, uh, uh, mm, the level of disparity between wages, etc., is also significant. So it's, it's often used simply as a subterfuge because no socialist in the world can go to any citizen in the world today and request a vote saying my model is Cuba or my model is Venezuela. They have to find something else. So they have to find a few countries out there that probably nobody has visited and mostly have only seen from Lily Hammer on Netflix and, um, uh, and, and create a fallacy for a country with uh, hundreds of millions of, 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 of citizens. But, it's, but it's, what you say is absolutely true, is that the model itself does not generate uh, an easier lifestyle. It is actually as complex as any other. That's an excellent point. Thank you, Daniel. A, a question for Dr. Moffat again from Jacob Boucher. What are your thoughts on government funded but privately owned uh, HSA accounts as a transition out of government plans such as Medicare and Medicaid? Oh yeah, I think that uh, especially for people who are on Medicaid and uh, Medicare, uh, we should allow the, the health savings account option in the Medicare program. I think that would make a lot of sense. Uh, with regards to people on Medicaid, I've always felt uh, that uh, people on Medicaid, especially young working families uh, who have a, have a hard time in many cases trying to find a doctor who would take care of them, the creation of an account, which could be held by the government, by the way, could, in other words, the, the government could hold the account for them, they would have a debit card, they could use that account in Medicaid to uh, access direct primary care for routine medical services. Uh, would improve dramatically, I think, their access to uh, 
to medical services uh, in, in that kind of a in that kind of a situation. And when they no longer are, uh, for example, when they're no longer uh, eligible for med uh, for welfare, for example, most of the people on Medicaid are on in welfare. Uh, they could uh, they could that that account could be turned over to them uh, in the form of a cash balance, or they could uh, tra transfer that money into a private health insurance plan. Uh, if they decide to go to work, it'd be an employment-based plan or a private health insurance plan if they were no longer dependent on the government. I think that's a very, very good way to go. The more direct payment that we have to doctors, and we, the more we establish a direct relationship between doctors and patients and reduce a lot of this uh, third-party bureaucratic interference, the better things are going to be for doctors, patients, and frankly, for the healthcare system. Yeah, I, I think that's. Uh, I think health savings accounts are a great idea. We should use them whenever and wherever we can, not only in the private sector but also the public sector. Thank you, Bob. Here's a question for Danielle uh, from a viewer who says that he understands we we've been talking mostly about Europe, Asia, United States, Canada. Uh, where does the the African continent fall in this? Uh, what what are the the benefits of economic freedom for sub-Saharan Africa? One of the things that we learn from the African continent is how devastating socialism is. We have uh, countries, I have been, I have had the privilege of being in charge in a, in a multinational of uh, looking for business in West Africa, the Middle East and uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And I've seen a development that is so disappointing compared to the possibilities of those countries and compared to the richness that they have and the and if you look at the continent you look at africa and you go country by country what do you see you see mostly socialist regimes socialist regimes that promise everybody that they're going to redistribute wealth look at what is happening right now in south africa is extremely extremely disheartening um, but I think that the, the lessons are two. The first is look at what an incredible level of development and improvement countries like Nigeria, countries like uh, Zimbabwe, uh, compared to Zimbabwe, for example, have uh, achieved. Look at the level of uh, improvement of countries in which suddenly you have an opening of the economy, people start to have their own business, etc., relative to, as I said before, relative to a Zimbabwe, relative to uh, places in which the government is destroying the purchasing power of the currency and at the same time expropriating the land. Um, so there's, there, those are two important lessons, is that like we, I mentioned before about Latin America, where we have a tale of two recoveries, one in which the countries with higher economic freedom and more open economies are going to fall less and recover faster. Uh, and the ones that are, have implemented what is called socialism of the 21st century, which is actually like the socialism of the 20th century, devastating. Uh, uh, is a they fall more and they recover slower. And the same happens in Africa. You go to Africa today, look at the, uh, at the country by country, and you look at, you know, with all of the challenges that they have, relatively open economies, relatively open societies in which there's at least a certain level of independent um, uh, institutions in which investment, uh, foreign direct investment is encouraged, etc compared with the redistributing socialist regimes, and you have almost to a T, the countries that will fall the least, the first ones, the ones that are going to recover faster, and in the others, the ones that are going to continue to be severely penalized. And this is interesting. In many cases, when you discuss with the socialists, they will tell you that the, chat, the differences of growth or improvement in an economy actually have more to do with demographics than with uh, government intervention or not. Well, Africa shows you not. They have almost the same demographics and you can actually see countries that develop much faster and grow much quicker precisely because of economic freedom, openness and, uh, and independent institutions. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, 
And here's a question for Dr. Moffat again. Uh, this is from Bridget Fisher, who says that Vice President Biden is in her hometown right now meeting with families who are benefiting from the Affordable Health Care Act. And she's wondering how has that been implemented? Um, she thinks she thought that the ACA would have been contested in the courts. So if you could enlighten us, please. Well, the ACA is is being contested in the courts. Uh, as you know, uh, the uh, state of Texas and a group of other states have filed suit against uh, uh, the ACA, uh, arguing that it is unconstitutional based on the provisions that were enacted back in 2000, uh, or rather, uh, based on the premise of the United States Supreme Court decision that the individual mandate was uh, constitutional because it was a tax. Now we don't have the tax, uh, so therefore we have a provision of the law that is not supported by the taxing power of the Congress. It's a constitutional question. It's not a policy question of health care. So it is being contested right now in the courts. And whatever happens uh, on that narrow constitutional question, I think, uh, is not going to change the nature of the debate on health care. Uh, look, there's no question that if, if you were a low-income person, you did not have access to private health insurance, uh, the ACA provided very generous subsidies for low-income people, no question about that. But what a lot of people forget is that the ACA has basically wrecked the insurance market for millions of Americans. Um, back in, the, in 2010, just to give you an example, the, the, the Congressional Budget Office said that by 2018, there would be 24 million people enrolled in the ACA because it's such a great program, right? It's everybody's going to be jumping into it. The result was actually 10.6 million people were <laughs> enrolled in, in 2018, and now it's down to 8.3. What happened? What happened was the cost of the program went through the roof. And if you made anything more as a working individual, more than $50,000 a year, you were faced with the premium increases, as I said earlier, of uh, of 125 percent in the in the ACA, right? If, given the, under the current law, if, if you're an individual, you're deductible. This is the standard average plan, right? The, the individual deductible, what you pay before any insurance kicks in, is four thousand dollars and change. If you're a family, you'd be paying eight thousand dollars and change. Now, who can afford that? Well. About 4.1 million people dropped out of the private health insurance market because of that. We actually have less private health insurance coverage in the individual market with the ACA than we had before it. That is a monumental policy failure. And Biden can say all, all he wants about how the ACA has been a success. It's a success as long as the government is basically taking care of you as a low as a low-income individual, but if you're middle class, you're getting killed uh, with the ACA, and an awful lot of these people dropped out of insurance. We can do a lot better than the ACA, and we can certainly control cost. And if the AC was, ACA was such a big success, why are half of the House Democrats in favor of repealing it and imposing uh, a total government control over the economy? Somebody explain that to me, because I still don't get it. Jim, maybe somebody can tell me. Maybe one of our listeners can figure this out, because I, I don't get it. Well, that's an excellent question, Bob. I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative of asking the last question of Dr. Lacaye, and that is, uh, you. Uh, the subtitle of your book refers to social capitalism. I wonder if you could expand on that a little and, and calm the fears of some uh, that, that might think that that's a, an opening of a door to morphing into full-on socialism. Uh, it's, it's done on purpose. The reason why I wanted to use the word social is to, is to steal it back, to recover it from the left. You know, it's, it's absolutely atrocious when we hear, for example, the left talking about social justice, when what they actually want is a complete government decision on justice. That is not social justice when they talk about social spending, which is mostly uh, massive levels of administrative costs. So the reason why I wanted to use the word social was to do precisely what the person that asked the question did, is to remind our readers that the left has made the social word uh, a completely different thing. 
capitalism is the most social system. And social capitalism is actually, as I explain in the book, I'm not going to uh, explain it too much so that you have the ability to, to, to read it, but it's mostly to detach statism out of what we call today capitalism. What is statism? It's all those things that we hear in the general debate that usually are used as traits of capitalism are actually traits of statism. Massive money printing to finance huge government deficits, to uh, keep zombified uh, sectors that are close to government. So cronyism and statism detached out of capitalism. So it's actually, literally, social capitalism is to bring back true level of free market in which government plays the role of administrating and administering and uh, at the same time uh, providing an, uh, a framework that is stable and solid enough so that the private sector thrives. In reality, social capitalism is literally getting back the word to capitalism uh, where, it's where it actually belongs. Thanks so much, Daniel. Well, this has certainly been a, an enriching discussion. I, I thank the audience members who submitted very thoughtful questions. I hope that everyone has, uh, has gotten something out of this, uh, this interesting discussion. I know that I have. Thanks especially to Dr. Bob Moffat and, of course, to our guest uh, and the uh, author of Freedom or Equality, Dr. Daniel Lacaye from Madrid. That's the end of this webinar. We hope you'll join us for future webinars at the Heritage Foundation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.